Um, well, welcome everybody. I presume you're here, which is very strange. <laughs> I have no sense of there could be nobody here at all. Um, but um, welcome to the Scholars at Work. Uh, uh, my name is Michael Trainer, and it's a particular pleasure today because the speaker is my colleague, um, Helen Allen. Um, um, before I um, introduce her, because I've got a few lines about her, I just want to pass on a bit of information that if you're um, a, a student, you're really, really, you're super welcome to this. I just need to um, tell you that you don't need to sign in in the chat with your name and student number because your attendance is kind of um, taken from the recording. And so there's no need to do that. So just kind of relax and um, uh, listen and enjoy the, um, the presentation. Now, let me tell you about Helen. Um, Helen Allen, she's professor of nursing uh, here at Middlesex University in the department of uh, child, um, nurse of adult child and midwifery nursing. If, no, that's not quite right. I think you know what I mean. Um, she writes that she's had three um, professional careers so far um, as a practitioner, a nurse in intensive care and in women's health, um, as a teacher um, for the last 20 years. I, I'm sorry, and for the last 20 years, <laughs> um, she's been a researcher uh, in nursing. And um, her research is for theological view of the world uh, and of the issues in it. And she's co-founder and lead of the Center for Critical Research in Nursing and Midwifery here in um, the department whose name I messed up. So um, having said that, um, I'd like to welcome Helen and say that the, the room is yours uh, and we're looking forward to hearing what you've got to tell us. Um, okay. about this topic. Thank you, Michael, and welcome to everybody. Um, this is a different title to everybody, to the one I put out. Um, so I, I hope I haven't um, <clears throat> lured you here on false pretenses. I'm going to talk about some, some of my reflections on theory and the theory practice gap in nursing. And I've put quotes around the theory practice gap because I think of the theory practice gap as more as a theory practice split. And I'll explain why as we go on. Um, and it's related to the book I'm writing on how nurses, all nurses and midwives, theorise in practice rather than um, adapt or put into practice theories. OK, um, please forgive me if I sound a bit out of breath. Um, that just happens when I'm speaking. So the seminar plan is to recap on, recap on ideas around theory, nursing theory, theorists, the theory practice gap, introduce what I call the theory practice split, look at um, a project I've been doing on advanced clinical practice as a way of illustrating what I mean by the theory practice split, um, and then talk a little bit about the atheoretical nature of higher education contract research work and then draw some concluding thoughts together about the state of um, nursing theory and the role of nursing theory in HE today. And I would like to stress the importance um, and why I think this is relevant for staff and students. So stress the importance of theorizing in nursing rather than nursing theory, and which I think we can use to dismantle the theory practice split. <coughs> So what is theory? Well, the theory is often taken in everyday um, terms to mean an untested hunch or a guess without support or evidence. I guess that's how um, a lot of us would use it in, ev in everyday life. But for scientists, and I guess I'd have to include myself here, although I never think of myself as a scientist as such, but as a researcher, as an academic, as a nurse who's interested in producing knowledge for nursing, Theory has nearly the opposite meaning. A theory <coughs> is a well-substantiated explanation of an aspect of the natural world that in, can incorporate laws, hypotheses, and facts. So it's a theory of how we practice. Mm -hmm. That's what it's meant to be. Um, and I think that's problematic for all sorts of reasons, because I, as I'm going to show, I think a lot of the nursing theories that we've used historically in nursing, and I'm sure the same would go 
the midwifery <coughs> don't illuminate our practice at all. They have an they illuminate they are an example of an idealized practice rather than a, than a real practice. So one of the questions I'd like you to consider as you're listening to me and as you go away from this, this session this afternoon is what version of theory do you use in your practice? Do you use it in its everyday common sense way as an untested hunch or a guess without supporting evidence? Or do you use it in its full scientific meaning? And is the theory you use in practice, and this is an important one, is the theory you use in practice different to what you'd be expected to use in your university assignments? And I, I think it is, and I think we're already in, inculcating in you as our students, the theory practice gap. <coughs> so another question I'd like you to consider as where, where you're listening to me today is what theories can you think of that you use, which might be seen as specifically nursing theory? And often when I'm teaching this face-to-face, -face, I get people in small groups to think about what nursing theory they use in practice. And often they'll say, oh, I use pressure area care theory, or I use communications theory. And those are all relevant for nursing practice, of course. But I wonder what other theories we might use that might inform our approach to, pa to patients, our understanding of patients. So do you use, for instance, person-centered theory, or do you use um, a holistic model of nursing? So those are the sorts of questions I want you to be thinking of as I'm talking. <coughs> so I imagine you've heard of the theory practice gap. I think I've, I've interviewed student nurses over 10 to 15 years at all stages of their programs, and they've all talked about a theory practice gap. They've talked about a split or a gap. I should stick to the word for now. A gap between what they learn in university, what they learn in college, and what they see practiced on the wards. And either they see that they, their lecturers are telling them things about how practice should be practiced, how they, what they should see in practice, and it isn't. And then who's at fault? Is it the lecturers for telling them that the practice is ideal, idealized? Or is it the practitioners for not practicing to the high standard that's described in universities? So another question I think we should all be talking about is, or considering is what is the theory practice gap and what do you understand by this term? And maybe at the end of this session, you'll email Michael some thoughts about that. So let's play guess the nursing theorist game because I'm of a generation that was brought up on nursing theorists. I wrote curricula based on particular theorists. My particular theorist, I liked in the 90s, 1990s was Watson. Um, how many of the following women have you heard of and can name and what's the most noticeable thing about them? So here they all are, look at them. Okay, so look at all these. So what's the most notice noticeable thing about them? Well, the obvious thing that jumps out to me is that they're all white and they're all women. And apart from Brendan in the middle, he's the only man, Brendan McCormack, who has written a lot about person-centered care, um, and Kim Manley, who's also British and um, was really the originator of person-centered care in the UK, and they're all American. Oh, no, Nancy Roper up here in the top left-hand corner with the glasses and the pearls, she's, she's British. So they're all white, most of them American, most of them are female. They are Rosemary Parse, she's the one in the middle there with the hands clasped together. And then there's Imogen King, Madeline Leininger. Some of you might've heard of her. She developed cultural competency, model of nursing. There's Hildegard Petplow, those mental health nurses amongst you. She's up there in the top left-hand corner, her interpersonal theory. Some of you mental and health nurses might have heard of Hildegard Petplow. There's Imogen King, whose theory up there in the right hand corner is um, a theory of goal attainment. And then down in the bottom left hand corner, very nice picture of Virginia Henderson, who of course was instrumental in, think, in starting that early work in thinking about what nurses do and, and how they conceptualize nursing practice. 
So another question I'd pose to you, or how prominent are black or BAME nurse theorists? Um, I'm writing um, a book and I was looking for black nursing theory and I can't find um, black or BAME th nursing theorists whose work is celebrated like these grand dames of nursing theory that I've shown you. And there are plenty of black and BAME professors of nursing and researchers and I know a few in the UK but no one I think who we would see to be a theorist as it as the way that we were we used to think about these these um, older ladies as theorists and I think perhaps we who are the nursing professors don't think of ourselves as theorists anymore um, and even though the Americans seem ahead of us, so some very good online stuff about black, particularly this, this last month about Black History Month, about nursing leaders, they're still celebrating black and BAME nurses for their practice and their advocacy and our advancement of civil rights rather than their theoretical work. And I, I think that's interesting because it, it suggests that <coughs> there's a lack of knowledge really, both historically and present day about current nursing theorists that reflect diversity and reflect the nursing profession. There's plenty we know about Black and BAME British nurses. The story of Mary Seacole and Annie Brewster are now being recognised, but we all know it's taken detailed and historical work and the contribution of BAME nurses before and since 1948 is still not well recognised or well known and recognising the contribution of this group of nurses, both in nursing and the NHS, has proved to be difficult and resisted, as the lack of recognition of Mary Seacole shows us. And I think all these missing data says something about nursing theory and the theory practice gap. So what is the theory practice gap? <coughs> I conceive it as a continuous tension between realism, the doing side of nursing, the concrete stuff, the, 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 the activities we do, the work we do, the writing up we do, and idealism, the thinking side of nursing, which I would argue we don't spend quite so much time doing. And I found in my research that nurses are always happy and able to talk about nursing theoretically from this idealist perspective but they just don't often get the opportunities to do so. I suppose you could say that supervision, clinical supervision, um, when it was originally introduced and reflective practice when they were both originally introduced in the 90s were a way of providing opportunities for nurses working in practice to think about nursing, but I think those thinking spaces have been squeezed so much. Um, I think this tension between theory and practice, between doing and thinking, is continually reproduced and has been for a long time in nurses' talk about the theory-practice gap. And by reproduced, I mean it's continually transmitted amongst the professions and across generations. So I find it very interesting when I interview first or second year nurses who, who quite confidently tell me about a theory practice gap, um, believing that it exists as if it's an unmutable thing that will never ever change. I prefer to think of it as a theory practice split because a split is an active word. We need to split things. We can't gap things. Gap just describes something that's passive. Each of us needs to conceptually think of splitting theory from practice uh, when, when we use split instead of gap. It reminds us what actually what we're doing when we're talking about the theory practice gap is splitting theory and practice artificially. Because I think when you talk to nurses, they theorize, that is, they link theory and practice together. So they will use evidence-based theory in their practice, but they will adapt it to the situation in which they find themselves. They will have very interesting ideas about person-centered care or holistic care or um, communication, but those will be an, an amalgam of theories which they've learned through their 
um, original program, their CPD and their experience to turn into their own theorizing. We explain our discomfort over the tension between doing and thinking by blaming or projecting the blame onto someone or into someone or something else. So it's the lecturer's fault. They've lost contact, contact with practice. It's the men, my mentor's fault. She doesn't nurse according to what I've been taught in college. And so it goes on and so it's reproduced. We continue to believe in something which doesn't actually exist, the gap. And we reproduce the gap through our thought as if it exists without thinking about it critically. In sociology, we would call this a reification, which is the error of regarding an abstraction as a material thing and attributing causal powers to it. In other words, the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. An example would be treating a model or an ideal type as if it were a description of a real individual or society. In this case, the error is treating the theory practice gap as if it really did exist, as if it were a thing. So what's the history of nursing theory? A lot, a lot of nursing theory to date has been ignored. How many of you know a nursing theory um, and could cite its fundamental conceptualizations? It's the building blocks of the theory. And lecturers, are the nursing theories embedded in your curriculum? Do you use them to underpin the curriculum? I would suggest we don't. We, I mean, these grand theories, which were very prominent, came to prominence in the 70s, 80s and 90s, last century. <laughs> Sounds, makes me sound ancient um, and makes them sound even more ancient. Um, I believe that they were imposed as theory from above. They were grand theories. They were ways in which these particular individuals or theorists conceptualized the world and they were imposed on nursing practice. And even worse, they, these grand theorists have profited from the gap by asserting that their particular theory is the theory of nursing and not providing any, that's maybe a bit strong, but much evidence that this is the case, that Parse, for instance, in her theory of becoming, human becoming, um, is evidenced through actual research. It's almost as if nursing theorists, these grand dames, have perpetuated nursing's lack of disciplinary knowledge. And they've, and by that I mean what I'm seeking to try in my book through using my research over the last years is to show how nurses disciplinary knowledge is evidence in their theorizing in practice in everyday practice. I used to think of the theory practice gap as something that existed for practitioners and then I became a teacher and I found it existed for me as a teacher because um, writing a curriculum sometimes became an art of using a nursing theory or a nursing model to underpin a curriculum. Whereas in fact, that had no meaning for any of the students that I was teaching. And then I became a nursing academic and I have realized that the nursing, the theory, nursing theory practice gap has become is ev evidenced in, in academic practice too. So I'm a, my role as a professor, a lot of it is spent as a PhD supervisor and a researcher where I spend my time encouraging my students and making myself explore theory to inform the social world to produce knowledge. Because without a theoretical basis to practice, aren't we just practicing the art of nursing rather than evidence-based practice. That's what I used to think, I think. Um, but I also have um, another part of my role, which is as a contract researcher, where theory and knowledge are not the goals. The focus of this work is this presentation, part of this presentation. In earlier work, um, I, I looked at student nurse experience of HEIs across different disciplines. I explored ideas around the massification and commun 
commercialization of HE in relation to the massification of students, so the dramatic expansion of students into HE in the 90s, and the maximizing of profit from numbers of students. And what I'm going to suggest today that this theory practice gap is in nursing, which has this history through, through nursing, situated within the academy, within the university system, has been made worse. And the example I'm going to use is of contract research. Because in the latter role, in the contract research role, I actively contribute to the profit of the university while doing nothing to develop theory or knowledge. Well, that's how it can feel at times. So this is a whole session in itself, governance, commodification and commercialization of knowledge. I think the point for me now is that um, it was put by Peter Wilby in The Guardian this summer. He said British universities, and there's been a lot about universities this summer, hasn't there? And about their growth, growth into profit making organisations. British universities have remodeled their governance along corporate lines, getting the majority of, of their funds, sorry, that's a typo, from private sources. Paradoxically, sorry, I've got, oops. paradoxically, every university, mainly through funding agencies and quality indicators, are subject to state control unthinkable 50 years ago. And another quote I found particularly interesting, markets are normally seen to entail less regulation. In HE, they are seen to need more. Um, so that's what I mean by the commodification of knowledge and the commercialization of knowledge and the increased governance. And that is all part of this pressure to undertake contract research as opposed to academic research. Although I won't deny that there are pressures also to undertake academic research. We have something called the REF, which is a research exercise framework, which Michael is busily um, producing for next year, which um, is a way of measuring our academic output. But alongside the, that, there, that work, there is this contract work. So the study I'm going to use in, as an example of this contract work, which I think contributes to the theory practice split is um, a study I was asked to do into advanced clinical practice. Now, uh, um, some of you may know that um, there are very good reasons for advanced clinical practice. Um, there are utilitarian reasons there. Um, these advanced roles for a range of practitioners, non-medical practitioners from clinical backgrounds um, could be essential in delivering new models of care for the future. Um, Oftentimes they're driven by the local workforce. We know that there are ongoing challenges in retaining junior doctors and increasing complex, increasingly complex needs of patients. There's a drive to develop and upskill nurses and other clinical practitioners to occupy advanced clinical roles. And there's a national agenda where non-medical advanced practitioners have had the opportunity to share workload with medical staff in both urgent and emergency care settings. So there are very good reasons for advanced clinical practice. The funder asked us to evaluate um, across the London NHS region, um, the extent and adoption of advanced clinical practice roles, the factors facilitating or deterring the development of the roles, future plans for the development of new and existing staff. Um, and the, the reason there were three evaluations was that the funder divided the funds to the three HEIs that competed for the, for the award. Um, and we all um, had an equal number of NHS trusts to, to undertake an evaluation. Um, there was a shared design and synthesized findings in the final report to the funder. However, and this is where I, I feel this is a theoretical, this type of research. This, while this seemed a seemingly straightforward project, which meets the need to understand an innovation in practice, in actual fact, it was a theoretical, and I'll go on to explain why. Oh, I'll say um, here, it was um, nominally, it was an interpretive qualitative design, that is, it was based on interviews and um, 
face to face in some cases and um, Zoom interviews and some focus, focus groups. Um, and it was interpretive because we, the researchers, were interpreting what participants were telling us in interviews. The other under, study was undertaken between in two months, between October and December 2019, across five acute trusts. Um, eligibility was to participate was were consenting senior leaders associated with ACP recruitment training commissioning of the role. All senior leaders who met the criteria were sent an invitation. Senior leaders expressed an interest to participate and a consent form was sent out and returned. Um, and my point here about theory practice is gap is that as contract researchers, we operate in exactly the opposite way in which we do as academics, because we don't have time built in for reflection. So two months to collect qualitative data is a short period of time. And you can see from the design that it wasn't us, the researchers contacting our participants and gaining access, that was all done for us by the funders who were in a position of authority vis-a-vis -vis, um, the, uh, the, the, funded, the funders of the evaluation who had also funded the ACP development and training. In academic research, we might have expected those relationships between funders, between researchers and between research participants to be more critically unpacked and thought about so that there wasn't any bias. Instead, what we did as researchers was come in through an introduction of the funder to a trust and ask senior people and um, advanced clinical practitioners what they thought of what they'd been given by the original funder. So you can see some of the confusion that might arise. But there were other problems or flaws with the design. Um, although it was nominally nursing, we three research teams came from very, very different traditions in nursing. We came from clinical research, we came from sociology, we came from health services research, we came from psychology, and we came from mental health services. Now, all of those different traditions in nursing research, let alone nursing practice, have different thoughts, different ways of conceiving the world. How I conceive the world as an adult, in fact, I don't call myself an adult nurse, as a general nurse, informs how I think about research, how my colleague in one of these other teams as a psychologist thinks about the world as a psychologist informs the sorts of questions and the sorts of interpretation she will give to data. So in health services research, they're more concerned with theories of innovation in healthcare systems and relationships between professions. My own interest in ACP is um, based on some work I did in the 90s in fertility care, where I looked at the personal emotional journeys of service redesign on individual profession professionals and their ethical and moral rationalization. So two very almost conflicting ways of, of understanding innovation and change. Um, so we had a shared experience of contract research as academics with external funders. We did share that in common, but we didn't share a theoretical stance on ACP or advanced clinical practice or discuss our perspectives because the time was so short. There was a retrospective discussion of methodology when we came to write the papers arising from the evaluations, but this wasn't discussed beforehand, again, because time was so short. All access was, all, and as I said, all access was negotiated by the NHS Trust, so researchers didn't establish any relationships with participants beforehand. And any of you who um, have read anything about qualitative research will know that one of the um, suppositions or, the, or the, the premises of qualitative research is that you establish research relationships with your participants as a researcher. And in this case, we had no prior ways to or time to establish relationships before we started the interviews. The data collection was 59 semi-structured individual joint or focus interviews um, in autumn 
2019 was a cross-section of system and service leaders, senior managers and clinicians, as well as practitioners in 11 NHS trusts. And they weren't just acute, they were across a range of trusts. However, when it came to the analysis, we never shared transcripts, which we would do in academic um, surveys. So in academic research, um, if you had a large multi-site, multi-team research project, you would build in ways to your data collection and your data analysis to share data collection and to share data analysis across the whole team, not have three separate teams doing their own thing and then coming together at the end. The data analysis was open. Um, it was thematic analysis at two levels within teams and then at the end of the project across the team. So within each evaluation, separate evaluation, then across the evaluations. Um, and then one um, team in that open, in that first level of analysis within the team, within the separate evaluation, had used, also said they'd used closed um, data analysis, which was framed by the research questions. So that, that immediately op offers a way in to say, well, your, your analysis was, was effectively flawed. There was no theoretical justification for this. The final analysis of all three analyses was a response to the funder who asked after submission of all three evaluations for a synthesis to be written. The synthesis of the findings, I think, was essentially meaningless as each research team had used their own theoretical stance to inform their their evaluation and paper while drawing on the whole set of the findings. And we're now at a situation where each evaluation team has been asked to write a paper um, or has agreed to ask, write a paper, drawing on the whole analysis, um, but informed by their, their theoretical, the again, by their theoretical stance. So, Again, it seems very mismatched and not something you do in academic research. And I certainly, I spend my time telling my PhD students to, they're going to use mixed methods that the data has to speak to each other. You ca just can't expect to combine data at the end after you've, if you've collected the data. So the findings, and this is where there's another theory, uh, theory practice gap or, or split, um, because the, si the findings have been uh, so generalised as to make them, I would argue, just confirm the funders' preconceptions before the evaluations. So they're descriptive. Um, ACP roles are clustered around a small number of services such as urgent and emergency care, musculoskeletal services, critical care and podiatry, with very limited workforce planning about the future role of ACPs. There was found to be a low level of familiarity with NHS advanced clinical practice multi-professional framework in trusts and with the concept of advanced clinical practice more generally. And it's a second sentence that interests me. Um, <clears throat> um, surely that's no surprise to anyone who knows how the NHS works and how change works in the NHS that really is, is saying very little. You need to understand why that's happening, not just make a, a, a high level descriptive comment like that. But the funders seem happy with that. Another um, finding from the report, the enthusiasm from a wide range of professionals and senior managers around the potential of these roles to make a contribution across services in terms of enhancing patient care in line with current national policies and staff career pathways. OK, however, it's again, it's a second sentence. Some participants saw ACPs as a means of addressing staffing shortages, particularly of junior doctors, although it was acknowledged that junior doctors are not advanced practitioners and participants were keen to avoid this association being seen as dumbing down ACP roles. Surely that's no surprise. So what's, I suppose I'm left with so what? What have I learned from this? What have the funders learned from this? Where's the new knowledge? 
Another finding, identification for funding sources for AC poll, ACP roles was seen as a major factor in future planning with some opportunities arising through commissioning and business planning processes, but otherwise the absence of ring fence finance for ACP posts was an inhibitor. Factors supporting and inhibiting the development of such roles vary to some extent between types of professions, but overall demonstrate an interplay between the resource environment, the extent of knowledge about ACPs, the receptiveness of the service environment, and the extent of features associated with proactive change management. Again, there was very little money. Well, don't be surprised about that. Um, ACP studied and met their mentors in their own time. Motivation was largely internally career focused and money was determined overall by the by the receptiveness of the research of the service environment. And again, my question has been to um, my fellow evaluators, well, what have we learned that's new about this? What knowledge are we contributing? And lastly, the uncertainty about the evidence of the value of AC pool roles in different types of services was reported to be an inhabit inhibiting factor and local evaluations were rare or undertaken in the past and not available. Um, evaluations hadn't been built into the introduction of change either from funder or at local service level and for those of you who know anything about evaluation research which has been ongoing for many decades um, evaluation needs to start at the beginning of planning a project now we've known that, as I say, for many decades, and yet still we're introducing change into the NHS without building in evaluations. So again, where is the knowledge that this research or this evaluation is contributing to? So in terms of theory, do I think there's been knowledge production in this from this project? Well, no. The lack of theory in the research design in the analysis and write-up of the report for the funders um, is evident to me. In many ways, we validated their prior assumptions of ACP, Advanced Clinical Practice in London. The funders have accepted their findings, which confirm the literature, but point to some interesting resistances to ACP and moral and ethical agency amongst participants in deciding to take on these roles. However, as with other projects, I have the findings haven't been published and there seems no desire to publish. Now that could be because of the time we're in at the moment, but I suspect it's because as, as I have suggested, evaluations on repeated projects or clinical change projects are, are completed with no knowledge that's produced to inform further change and innovation or further evaluations in the NHS anyway. Um, in this particular case, um, the authors haven't been asked to render the report anodyne. What sometimes happens when you write a report is that there's a lot of toing and froing between the funders and the contract researchers in HE about the findings if the evaluate if the evaluation findings are uncomfortable. In this case, there, there, there has been none of that. Um, it, and I describe that as a toning down of the language. And those are the um, I've been asked to tone down negative language in various evaluation reports or to use less inflammatory language. And I think then it becomes a kind of self-policing. So if you have self-policing of language, then how can you contribute to knowledge production? So the theory practice gap, the net, the, my argument in this presentation has been that the disconnection, is that a word, between, I've described between ground nursing theory and practice is related to the disconnection between academic practice and contract research in HE. They both actively reproduce the theory practice split. An alternative view of the state of theory in nursing would be a focus on the relationship between thinking and doing in nursing practice or theorizing in practice. And there are a series of papers in the repository that you have access to on how newly qualified nurses theorize in practice. In my current work, I'm using two theoretical 
ideas, the theory of recontextualization and McCormack and Manley's person centered theory to illustrate ways in which nurses in different nursing roles think about and articulate their purpose, i.e. they theorize to make sense of practice and construct working theories to assist them. And sometimes they use grand theory, sometimes they use evidence-based theory and the practice areas I've so far examined um, and will include in my new book will be fertility nursing, advanced practice, overseas nurse migration and ethnocentric practice, newly qualified nurses and student nurses in general medicine and surgery, new community health, mental health roles and governing body nurses. There's, and one final point I just want to make is Let's go back to that slide there. So I'm working on this link about how nurses theorize in practice. Um, and the purpose of today was to draw my thoughts clearer on the theory practice split for me in my role as a nursing academic. Thank you very much. And there's some, the last few slides, which I believe are put up on the, um, on the VPN we'll have two um, publications there um, around um, advanced clinical practice. Thanks. Great. Um, thank you, Helen. Um, so um, we've got about 15 minutes to kind of uh, discuss and ask Helen questions. I mean, it, uh, it seems, as Helen said just a minute ago, that um, there's sort of two areas that people might want to um, ask questions about. And one, and one is um, th theory and um, nurse education, because that's, I guess that's what uh, a lot of the people here are uh, involved in, either as educators or as students. Um, and, the other, and the other area that I hadn't talked about was the, the kind of experience of um, of doing research and the and the, con the practical constraints that can make theorizing um, uh, difficult to achieve. So you know, feel free to ask questions, make comments in both of those areas. I've got um, a, a comment here from um, Tina Tina Moore, um, and she says, "Helen, uh, many thanks for talking about an important topic." Um, she says, "It could be my interpretation." But you speak as though the practice theory gap or split is a negative concept. Um, I believe that we need to continually examine practice, academia and practice, and keep these conversations going in order to forward practice. I believe that the split stroke gap is required, um, but it's how large this gap is uh, when it becomes problematic. And then I actually can't. Tina says, sorry, I have to go to another meeting. <laughs> so we can discuss it, but Tina isn't here to um, um, to respond again. But so, uh, OK, so she seems to be saying, well, OK, there's an assumption that it's a bad thing, but she's suggesting, and actually, I've got to be honest, I'm not sure why, but she's suggesting actually maybe it's, it's inevitable uh, and it's only when it becomes a huge gap that it's problematic. So I, what do you think of that? It's really, really interesting. As ever, Tina always has an interesting view on things. So, yeah. and I enjoy supervising her in her PhD. So that's really, really good. Mm. Um, I suppose it's a very good point. I, I, I think there's creativity in a split, but I think it's about making that split creative rather than um, investing in it as a way to not think because I think what happens at the moment is as I said um, early on that the the tension between thinking and doing is there in any praxis isn't it it's there for I don't know bus drivers it's there for medicine it's there for biochemists there's always a disconnect between thinking and doing I think nursing has particular historical context and a gendered context in which thinking is 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 not seen to be part of of doing um that makes it possibly slightly different to other more masculine areas of praxis <coughs> 
those thinking spaces have been squeezed out and you could argue that that nursing as a gendered as a largely female professions allowed that to happen in in gendered ways because of historical oppression we'll leave that to one side but there's those thinking spaces have generally I do think been squeezed out of practice and of the curriculum I would argue and therefore our ability to think creatively through the ten this tension this split through the tension no let's say our ability to think creatively through this in as a result of this tension then creates the gap whereas I think by acknowledging that there is a gap or a split we could be more creative about recognizing that there is there is a need as Tina's arguing for a split I would say rather than a gap well I mean maybe okay this is a question really to everybody the 64 people who are here um, do you and how do you uh, experience what Helen just said, this sort of attention between thinking uh, and doing? So whether you're a, a, you know, a lecturer or whether you're a, you know, a student, um, nurse or midwife, it'd be interesting if you want to make a comment about how you, how you experience that or, what, or maybe you don't experience it or maybe you've only just, seeing as you've heard about it, you're suddenly thinking, oh yeah, maybe I do. So that would be interesting. Um, anyway, maybe, so maybe somebody will... Hi, um, Michael. Um, Alison has her yeah. hand up. I don't know if she'd like to comment. Oh, okay. Um, Hi, right. I was just... Tina's, Tina's um, viewpoint got me thinking that as a post-registration teacher, I do the, you know, don't really teach the undergraduates, but trying to make my living on filling the gap in a way now that's what's brought into the into the classroom, isn't it? This is the challenges. This is what we're doing under all the constraints, and then trying as a lecturer to have a sort of um, a debate on how you how you overcome that gap. Um, how, how can you be creative? How can you make sure you've got the knowledge that underpins the theory? That's what we bring to the classroom. So that gap is at least narrowed. Um, so I had never thought about it before, but I guess that's the large bit, mm. large part really of what we do is that certainly in our, mm. you know, our updates and. Yeah. And maybe there's more space to do that in the post registration curriculum, as opposed to the undergraduate curriculum. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I used to, I think, use the space of the personal tutor role in the undergraduate curriculum when I was at Surrey to um, to use this doing thinking tension as a creative way to talk about how they were theorizing I didn't call it theorizing then I, mm. I think I just called it thinking but now I do think they're theorizing and we've got evidence for that in those papers mm. on delegation um, but my sense is that pure personal tutor role is threatened through the massification that the numbers the sheer numbers we have the demands of the nnc to fulfill meet the standards to pack the curriculum so that there is such an emphasis on doing and not so much on thinking and certainly not on thinking about doing and doing that in a safe space mm. Thanks, Alison. Um, any other comments or thoughts? I mean, this, we could take this in many directions, so feel, feel free to throw something in from an unexpected um, place. Um, Paul, Paul has got, I think, is asking a question. Oh, yeah. Paul, yeah. You're on mute. Yeah, you need to turn um, unmute yourself, Paul. Brilliant. Okay. No, you're still you're still muted by the look of it. Ah, okay. That's, that's it. Yeah. Hi. Uh, uh, thank you very much for this very illuminating lecture. Um, actually, I can see a trend um, in this lecture and what you have said about this gap because if 
a gap actually exists. A gap really, really exists because of the trend that is not only peculiar to Norton, but you can see that generally, I'll digress a little bit from Norton. Globally, in the last uh, couple of decades, we are the world economies in what is called uh, new, new liberalism. That is, I'm trying to link in this uh, uh, commodification and commercial, commercialization. Mm. If, if you uh, can, if you understand what I mean, if you look at the trend in USA, for example, mm. prison is also being commercialized. Uh, mm. Even here, uh, there's one uh, um, organization called um, something for. Um, what is it called that they, they allocate the management of prisons and um, it is this, is this tendency to bring commerce into the world stage, the free entry and free exit. So by the end of the day, what we are seeing is that the powers that, that finance um, uh, this nursing business are the ones that are dictating Mm -hmm. He who pays the piper, so to say, uh, it tells the tune. So that is what we are witnessing. Uh, I can blame this present situation on the commercialization and the commodification of nursing business, so mm -hmm. to say. So, but like uh, one of my lecturers said, the, the gap can only be filled as you suggested on this postgraduate post level, where people are allowed also more to bring their own input. I'm a, a student of critical thinking. My background originally is law. We are taught to critically discuss and analyze issues, which might not apply 100% because subject matter in nothing is human beings. You cannot afford to make mistakes. But we there should be more introduction of area uh, of this freedom a little bit of freedom into nursing practice that is so much codified by all these bodies that are being financed by the powers that be, the powers that finance nursing business. So it, it is about the question of to what extent should nursing profession be commercialized? Is there any way that it could be limited because otherwise the trend will continue to get worse and worse. That is my own input. That's a very number of issues you've touched on, Paul, is it? Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, uh, I've written about some of that in a paper on ethnocentrism in British nursing. Um, that was from work I did um, interviewing overseas migrant nurses and their observation that the British nursing system is so heavily monitored and policed, policed in inverted commas, mm -hmm. um, as to deny its, um, the humanness in nursing, which might link to your argument about commercialization and commodification. I mean, um, and in the paper I wrote on massification, that's what we were finding that, um, the universities were struggling to deal with students from non-traditional backgrounds because they didn't fit the model that had been developed, um, the commodification and commercialization model that had been developed for students from a, a, a non-diverse background. And I don't mean diverse, I mean diverse in all its, in its, com its complexity, diverse in learning disability, you know, culture, everything. And, um, so I think there's some very interesting, but to what exist, I have I haven't have to do some more thinking about neoliberalism, neoliberalism and its effect on my argument. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it does, yeah. I'm, I'm sure it does. I'm sure yeah. it does because it does, it does, really. yeah, yeah. Mm. Look, I I don't want to shut down this this particular discussion because personally I find it interesting. But we've got two minutes left, and there's two comments here on the, in the comments pane. Uh, and I'm gonna just read them out to you, Helen, because one, mm. one is more a comment and another one is a question. So I'll read them both mm. um, and you can respond as you wish. So the, the first is from uh, Monday uh, and he says, thank you very much for this presentation. How did you manage the issue of credibility and trustworthiness in this research, considering the methods of selecting the participants 
uh, and the interest of the research funders. So that's that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. And the second is from Mark Francis. And he said, en enhancing meaning in nursing practice will contribute to closing the theory practice gap and will eventually expand consciousness in a way that's congruent with one's worldview. Okay. Mm. That's, that's, oh, that's a, a lot going on there. I'm yeah. not sure I got all of it, but anyway, so one question, uh, one comment. If, well, if, if, uh, if, if I just reply to the, the question, um, because I think like the last comment, those are really interesting issues that we could debate further and and we haven't got time today so in relation to credibility and trustworthiness monday um i think i react i think i coped with it by um giving this presentation <laughs> because i i felt there were i felt it really came to me that this i mean this is i don't know how many of these contract research evaluations i've done a, a, a large number in my career but this point, I thought, gosh, you know, what am I doing as an academic researcher? If my remit is to produce knowledge, why am I not producing knowledge? And why am I doing it in a way that I do think the credibility and the trustworthiness of the data is in question? Um, it's not something I do normally. It's not something I teach as part of good ethical and sound research practice so why am i expected to do so as a contract researcher so uh, just a, a little uh, anecdote to share before we finish i used to attend um what was called a research committee research and sometimes the research and knowledge transfer committee at the kind of school level for years many many years met the same people every 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 time and i come away from that as did everybody else having not a clue about what research people did, what they were interested in, what theories they were interested in. But I knew everything about how much everybody had earned. So that kind of gives you a kind of sense of yeah. how um, kind of research work can get kind of commodified in, yeah. in a university setting and just, just be about kind of circulating uh, cash really, basically. Um, and, and, and that just on one last point in relation to Paul's question, yeah. I think then that becomes in terms of practice, how many beds, how your bed transfers and your bed state is, is managed and how many people you get throughput and how much how much bed, a bed occupancy you have. That, that's how it gets translated in, in neoliberalism in, in the NHS. Yeah. Anyway, probably need to end there, don't we? Yeah, we do. Um, thanks, Helen, very much for that. Mm. That was really kind of got people thinking and thank you everybody that came yeah. along and I hope you found it of interest and stimulating and that you'll be kind of um, thinking about these issues so thank you everybody and uh, hopefully thank see you. you next time yeah bye bye bye, bye. bye. bye.